the Churches of Christ present Bible Talk. One of my favorite Bible stories has always been the victory of God's people over the city of Jericho. It's just amazing how these people stood up to the great city by following God's instructions and, and you know what happened, the walls fell down flat. Oh, there's so many lessons that we could learn from that great victory. But you know, just one chapter later, Joshua chapter 7, we see this same victorious people suffer defeat at the hands of a little city called Ai. It's that defeat that will be the subject of our study today. I pray that you'll stay tuned after this song of praise. Oh, and the Hello again, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Bible Talk. It's my prayer that the lessons find you today in the best of health, both physically and spiritually. And I want to thank you personally for allowing me into your home today, giving me this wonderful opportunity to present to you a message from God's inspired Word. The victory of God's people is a consistent theme throughout the Bible. When we come to our New Testaments, the New Testament tells us how to be equipped for victory, namely by putting on the whole armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6. We find that through faith we have victory that overcomes the world, a, a victory that we have through faith, a faith founded in Christ, followed by obedience, and that flourishes in fellowship. That's 1 John chapter 5. The child of God, we find, has victory over sin and death and all of this through Jesus Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, Thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But today I want us to consider together not a victory, but rather a defeat. Specifically, the defeat of Joshua and the forces of Israel at Ai. It's been said that more lessons can be learned from failure than from success. Coach Nick Saban often talks about the the point of not wasting a failing. You know, learn from the lessons that are there to, to make yourself better, to learn and to grow and improve. And I believe that the same logic can be and needs to be applied to our spiritual lives. The truth of the matter is, is that there are going to be times for all of us, times in our lives where we do fail, where we do stumble or we falter. And the goal is always to learn from the defeat and then to be better for it so that we might be victorious when it comes again. With that thought in mind, I want us to turn our attention to the defeat at Ai and notice specifically what led to this defeat and what practical applications can be applied for us today. There are three things that it seems to me play a key role in the defeat of Joshua and the forces of Israel at little Ai. The first of these is pride. Now I want us to think first about the context in which Joshua 7 is found and think about the, the backdrop of this, this account. 
In Joshua chapter 7, we read about Joshua losing to, to Ai, but if you back up to Joshua chapter 6, they've just had this tremendous victory over the city of Jericho. They've conquered the great city. And what an amazing victory it was. We know that the city of Jericho was a great city. It's very likely that it was one of those walled cities that the previous generation feared that they could not take. If you go back to Numbers chapter 13, those uh, ten spies brought back that evil report and they said the cities are, are walled and great and well defended and Jericho was perhaps uh, uh, the epitome of one of those cities. But this generation, following the specific and detailed instructions of God, have taken the mighty city of Jericho. Now what an amazing victory and, a, a, and an account that's familiar to us from the, the time that we're children on through adulthood. But then we come to Joshua chapter 7. And after the tremendous victory at Jericho, they now turn their attention to this small city called Ai. And we read in Joshua chapter 7 about the belittlement of Ai. I want you to read with me Joshua 7 and verses 2 and 3. The text says, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. Think with, with me for a moment about these words. In their words we find that there is an an underestimation of Ai, and at the same time there is an overestimation of self. They think very little about the people of Ai and think too much of themselves. Let's continue reading the verses 4 and 5. It says, So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai, and the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Now, if you back up to Joshua chapter 4, we find that there were 40,000 fighting men just from Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And yet here, to go against the city of Ai, they choose to only send 3,000 men. That tells us again that they're underestimating Ai while overestimating themselves. John 8 and verse 25 tells us that the people of Ai numbered 12,000. And maybe we could understand why they would look at such a group and say, oh, they're, these, they're not worth our full strength. We don't have to worry about putting everybody out there. But how many have found themselves in situations just like they did that day where we find ourselves in distress and on the brink of defeat because we have underestimated the adversary and we've overestimated ourselves. People do it all the time. People talk about Satan and, and sin as though it's a joke, as something to, to play with, or we'll see how close we can get to the fire without getting burned. And, and, and we say things like, well... I can watch this because that's not going to bother me. I can filter out the bad and, and keep the good. I, you know, it, it's, no, I wouldn't let my children do it, but I'm an adult. I, what are we doing? We're underestimating the devices of sin and overestimating ourselves. Their pride after such a great victory over Jericho contributed to the defeat at Ai. Now, some have said that it wouldn't have mattered if they had sent all 40,000 because there was sin in the camp. And I agree with that. But if they hadn't been so full of themselves, they might have taken the time to consult God and found that out. But pride played a part. Secondly, it seems from the text that they were planning carelessly in their approach to take Ai. Ai. You can take Joshua chapter 7 and Joshua chapter 8 and, and the conquering of Jericho and the, the battle at Ai and there are several parallels between those two events. A few similarities and then some differences. 
It's interesting to me that in both instances, Joshua sends out spies. Joshua chapter 2, he sends two into the, uh, into the city to spy it out, and that's where we get the account of Rahab uh, hiding those spies. In Joshua 7 and verse 2, as we read a moment ago, we see Joshua again. He sends spies into the land to, to spy it out, get some information, you know. And in both instances, those spies come back confident. You know, in Joshua chapter 2, after they had spied out the city of Jericho, they come back and they say, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. You transition then over to Joshua chapter 7 and verse 3. And what are they saying? They're saying, we can do this. We can, we can go in and, and, and get it. You know, back here in our text in verse 3, it says, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people, for they are but few. But now, friends, that's where the similarities end. From that point forward, everything's a little bit different. And there's a very important and key difference. In Joshua 2 and verse 24, their confidence was in God. They said, truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands. But in Joshua chapter 7, God is not part of the equation at all. They've not consulted Him or, or considered Him uh, at all to that point. With the city of Jericho... God gives them the battle plan. God tells them what to do, how to do it, when to do it. But with AI, they conceive of their plan completely on their own accord. You know, don't send everybody, just send 3,000. That was their plan. With Jericho, there was no loss of life on the part of Israel. But with AI, 36 men are killed as they flee from that small city. Friends, if ever there was a reminder of the importance of planning with God, this is it. I often think about Ephesians chapter 6, and we're typically good at highlighting the different elements that make up the armor of God that we're to put on. But you know, that context doesn't come to a, a conclusion until after verse 18 where Paul tells us to pray. Because we cannot hope to go to battle victoriously against sin and the devices of Satan without incorporating and talking to our Heavenly Father. Part of the victory is planning with God. The battle belongs to the Lord. We cannot leave Him out of our plans. Just ask the rich fool of Luke chapter 12 how that works out. A man that had many great plans... The only problem was is that God was not in those plans. And God said, Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. And then whose good shall these things be? Their pride played a part in their defeat. Their planning carelessly without God played a part in their defeat. And ultimately they were defeated because, number three, of the presence of sin. In verses 6 through 9, we read about Joshua's cry to God because of this defeat. Beginning at verse 6, we read, Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening tide. And he and the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall uh, envire us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? In Joshua's cry, we need to acknowledge first that Joshua does the right thing here. In the, in the midst of defeat... Joshua turns to God and he gets before the presence of the Lord before the ark, verse 6. And there he cries out to God along with the elders of Israel. And I want you to notice that Joshua's concern is appropriate as his cry shows a concern for himself, for the whole congregation uh, of Israel, and also for the reputation of God. Now, 
God doesn't need man to hold him in a high reputation to be God. But there is a reminder there that the way we act, the way that we conduct ourselves, causes the people around us to think a certain way about God. And Joshua's concerned about that. What, what kind of image have we given to those around us about who you are, God? And Joshua does what any of us do when we have failed. He begins to doubt, to doubt himself and his mission. He says, we'd have been better off if we just stayed on the other side of the Jordan. But friends, when Joshua turns to God, that's when the answers are given. And it's revealed that there's sin in the camp. Notice with me verses 10 through 12. The Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel, this is why you lost. This is why they could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Finally, now we have the answer. Finally, God has been consulted and when God is brought into the equation, that's when all the answers are given. But now I want to notice with you the path back to victory. They've suffered the defeat. Their pride played a part in that. Their, their planning carelessly without God played a part in that. And ultimately, there was sin in the camp. And that played the, the, the largest part in it all. But you know, AI is still there. And Israel's still supposed to go take it. And so they've got to find the path from defeat back to victory. And there's going to be times in our lives where we find ourselves in that very situation where we've been defeated and the question then is, now how do I get back? Number one, their path back to victory begins with addressing the sin. And if you read in verses 13 through 26, that's exactly what Joshua and the people do. They find out that it's Achan who has sinned and they confront Achan about the sin and he says, when I saw the, the goodly Babylonish garment and the shekels of silver and the wedge of gold, he says, I took it and I, I went back and I hid it in my tent. And so they confronted the sin and then they, they faced the consequences of that sin. Achan and his, his household being punished, ultimately put to death because of that sin. But here's the point, friends. There is no victory until the sin is addressed. Secondly, their path back to victory, once the sin has been addressed, is then to follow God's plan. And that's what we find when we turn over to, to Joshua chapter 8. In Joshua 8, and it opens in verses 1 and 2, and it says, The Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise, go up to Ai, See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee in ambush for the city behind it. Is that okay? All right, I, I was defeated because of this, but now we've addressed the sin. What do I do now? Now we get back to God's way. Now you go back to God's plan and let him direct what we're going to do. And then, friends, there's that opportunity to grow in humility. In verses 3 through 8, as you read, you'll find that the people in chapter 7, remember, they only took 3,000. But now they're going to take 30,000. In chapter 7, it was their plan. It was man's plan. But in chapter 8, it's God's plan. In chapter 7, they had all confidence in themselves. But in chapter 8, all the confidence is in God. In fact, in verse 8, Joshua says, Do according to the word of the Lord. We're no longer following our word, no longer following our advice, but the word of the Lord. And friends, this time, this time they are given the victory. They traveled the path from defeat to back to victory when they addressed the sin, followed God's plan, and learned to grow in humility. Now, what practical applications 
can we take from this whole account and put into practice in our lives? Because, as I've already mentioned, we're, we are at times going to suffer defeat. And so here's what we can learn. Number one, I would submit to you that we need to remember that sometimes defeat comes when we least expect it. You know, sometimes after we've done something really well or something really good and we, we feel like uh, maybe we, we're untouchable, that's when Satan and his devices try to, try to creep in. Think about where these people were. A tremendous victory over Jericho. There's no way that it was in their, their mind at all. And we see it from the text that we read. You know, we just took down Jericho. We don't have to worry about AI. And sometimes temptation and defeat comes when we least expect it. I think about even the temptation of our Lord. Recorded for us Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. But you know what's interesting is in, in Matthew's account, his going and fasting in the desert comes immediately after his baptism. And so you have this tremendous event where, where John has uh, proclaimed him as the, the Lamb of God and, and, and he comes to John and you know, John says, I need to be baptized of you. But Jesus says, you know, no, we have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And so John baptizes him. The Father speaks from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit of God descends. I mean, it's just a tremendous event of the Scriptures. And then just one chapter later, here comes Satan tempting Jesus with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I'm simply submitting to you, friends, that sometimes it's after a great victory that we may be the most vulnerable. Sometimes defeat comes when we least expect it. So we must be on guard all the time. Secondly, we can learn from this account that we must not overestimate ourselves and underestimate our adversary. Proverbs 16 and verse 18, you well know, says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before the fall. We cannot overestimate ourselves. At the same time, we do not want to underestimate our adversary. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, Peter said, Our adversary is the devil. And he's walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's been said by uh, many preachers that Satan is ruthless, Satan is relentless, Satan is reckless. But he can be resisted. But we must be on guard. We cannot overestimate ourselves and underestimate our adversary. Number three, don't forget about God. We cannot leave God out of our plans. James said, you know, as you make your plans, he said you ought to say, if the Lord will, James chapter 4. Let's make sure that we include God in all of our plans. Number four, remember whose sin hurts. Sin ultimately hurts self. It hurts the congregation and those around us. And it hurts the Lord. One of the devil's greatest lies is, you're not hurting anybody. That's not true. Sin always affects more than just the one who's committing sin. Achan's decision to sin hurt everybody else. We need to remember that our sin, yes, it hurts us. But it also hurts those who are around us and ultimately it hurts our Lord, the one who gave His life for you and for me. And then friends, remember the path back to victory. Get up. That's what God told Joshua to do in verse 10. He said, get up and then address the sin. Follow God's plan. Learn and grow. Sun Tzu, the great uh, military leader and author of The Art of War, said that victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. And friends, today I want you to know that through Christ we can have the victory before we ever step on the battlefield. But We must begin by obeying the gospel with faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized, fully immersed to have our sins washed away. Mark 16, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21. Then we have the victory through Jesus Christ as we continue faithfully walking in the light as He is in the light, 1 John 1 and verse 7. Let us learn from their defeat so that we might hang on to our victory. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and God bless.
having questions about the Bible? Are you searching for a place to worship God like you find in the Bible? Do you have questions about your eternity? Would you like to know more about God's plan for you? Let me encourage you today to visit a church of Christ near you. If you're interested in learning more about the Lord's Church, we also offer free material. For more information or if you would like to have a transcript or a copy of today's program, whether audio or video, please go to our website at www.bible-talk.org or you can email us at bible.talk at bible-talk.org. You can also write to us at Bible Talk, P.O. Box 40, Fayette, Alabama, 35555. Simply include the program number and we'll be happy to send that to you completely free of charge. Thank you again for tuning in and may God bless you richly in your walk with Him.